Hello. So, hi, Bob. Hi, John. Hi, everyone else who I don't quite know your names yet, but I'll learn them and uh, it'll be good. So, my little community. I was talking about doing more story time type things. It's not really story time. It's just telling you um, about a situation in my life. And looking back, I do have um, not wisdom to impart, but some pretty serious situations and the way I handled them. So we are going to start at the beginning. Don't worry, I won't draw things out any longer than I have to. In 2010, on January 11th, so that makes my daughter's birthday 01110, which is super fun, um, I had a C-section. On February 7th, my sister, who had been ill, my older sister, she was 29, had been ill uh, the week prior. We don't know exactly what was going on. Um, I was checking in on her a lot. I do have a history as a nurse. Um, so I was just trying to feel out the situation. Uh, I was giving her a lot of Phenergan, which is for nausea, for those who don't know. Uh, it's very commonly prescribed um, in the ER. It's sort of one of those um, top three medication so they always give Finnegan they always give like Tylenol or Ibuprofen and they always or often give something for um pain um it depends the floor I worked on usually they would come up with Finnegan uh acetaminophen and Dilaudid which I've heard people pronounce Dilauda. Usually they're drug addicts. It was every two hours in the prescription if they had it. And man, they had those buttons ready 15 minutes before they were due. Drove me bonkers. And I didn't understand it because I was the type that if I got in a car accident, broke a bone, whatever, I if I filled the prescription at all, I brought it home, threw it in a box in my closet, which I know you're not supposed to do. And uh, I learned the hard way through my sister's ex-husband, my dead sister's ex-husband, that uh, people will find that and they will steal it. Um, anyway, so I had the C-section, January 11th, February 7th, the night before, February 6th, I had sent her to the hospital. She was cyanotic around her lips and the tip of her nose, which told me something was very, very wrong. We did not know. She did not know um, what was causing the problem. She was treated very badly at the hospital. They, while they were running tests, gave her a bag of saline. And in the saline, they put five milligrams of morphine. At some point, because of the way she was being treated, she left the hospital. She got a ride home. She just couldn't take it anymore. She was just being tormented by them. Um, they basically were treating her because she was in a lot of pain. She was very uncomfortable. They were treating her like she was a drug seeker. So she left. She was like, you know what? Screw you all. I'm out of here. Um, she, when I found out she went home that night, I was a little disappointed because I had hoped that she would be treated better and I had hoped that she would get the help she needed. So Sunday morning, the next morning, February 7th, I, I went to check on her. And she kept running baths and she wasn't staying in her bedroom anymore. She was staying in an extra bedroom right next to the hall bathroom because the bathtub was smaller. It was easier to fill. It was easier to keep warm. And she had a comforter on the bed in the room and she would literally just go from bath to comforter, bath to comforter. Something was very, very wrong. We still to this day don't know why and what. I went home because at the time I had a newborn, I had a two-year-old and I had a four-year-old. I went to check on her last around 11.30 in the morning. 
I thought, okay, we've got to figure out something today. Something we've, we've, this is kind of at the breaking point. We have to figure something out. So I went home to, to take care of the babies and the toddlers and just make sure everything was good. 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later, I get a phone call from 911 dispatch, a reverse phone call that my mother was next door because this was next door to where I lived. My mother was next door at my sister's house and she needed my help. They didn't say what, they were very calm. I assumed it was that they needed me to kind of uh, keep her steady, keep her okay, talk her into getting into an ambulance while we waited for an ambulance to come because they did mention an ambulance was coming. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna be sitting with her making sure she doesn't talk herself out of it. Well, my four-year-old followed me. I walked over because it was, you know, on the 20-acre property and I was able to just walk next door. My four-year-old followed me even though I told him not to. And when I walked in the door, I came in through the back door and I walked into the laundry room and then the kitchen. And as soon as I got halfway through the kitchen, I saw the feet in the hallway sticking out of her bathroom. And I knew this was much worse than I thought. My four-year-old was on my heels and I had tried stopping him on the porch and he followed me in. And as soon as I saw her feet, I stopped him and I said, no, honey, go outside, please. Please go outside, mommy needs you to go outside. So I ran to the bathroom. My mother is on the floor. She's got my sister laying on the floor. There's vomit everywhere. And I was told that she was found at the toilet vomiting and with her arm resting on the edge of the bathtub as if she was kind of between vomiting, but not sure that she was past it. So um, she died from a seizure. So I know that she didn't suffer at the end end, but she had had days of suffering before this. Of course, when the police get there, finding a 29 year old had died. So let me backpedal for a minute. I did 30 minutes of CPR, 30 minutes of vomit covered CPR. At the same time, I knew that she would probably come back with major brain damage. So a part of me wasn't fully trying. Like at first, yes, I was all in. I was, let me break some ribs. And then as I'm going through it, I had just had the C-section. I ripped it open. It completely tore open, which I didn't notice at the time because my adrenaline's going. I'm focused on the task at hand. I'm not worried about myself. The ambulance gets there after 30 minutes. They clip the leads to her toe. They get nothing. And they decide it's a lost cause and there's no reason to try. My mother's losing her mind. And I remind her the brain damage. I mean, she's she's had brain death. This is this is not savable. Um and even if it were, the situation would be bad and my sister wouldn't want to live like that. Now, the odd thing in this scenario is for years, my sister had said that she would be forever 29. But what she meant was that once she turned 30, she would just continue saying she was 29 forever. She didn't think she wouldn't make it. Four months before the seizure, she had a very traumatic birth to her fourth and final child. She was in the ICU for a week. She lost a lot of blood. They did a full hysterectomy. She almost died multiple times, multiple times. So six months later, or not six months later, four months later, when this happens, it was almost like, hey, that was supposed to be her time to go. We're taking her anyway. The police assumed it was a drug overdose, although they had nothing to support that. 
that was what they were focused on. So we were waiting painfully for six weeks on toxicology. In the meantime, Child Protective Services decided that because I lived next door and had three small children that I must also, even though they had no proof that she was on anything and that it had been a drug, or do a drug overdose, they decided that I must also be into that world. So they, I let them in, I let them check my house, my kids, drug test, everything. They still came after me. And they spent the next few weeks really tormenting me. I mean, the day we were choosing a funeral home, they pulled up as we were leaving. I had the baby packed up, the newborn packed up in her, in her car seat. And I was about to latch her into the car when they whipped up into the driveway and said they needed to see her and this, that, and the other. And I was so emotionally taxed. I actually grabbed the car seat and I held it out to them. And I said, if this is how you're gonna do things, just take her now because I can't do this. I can't be a mother to three kids, bury my sister. Her kids are suffering and have you showing up telling me that I'm living my life the wrong way when I'm not. I, I, was, I was breaking. I was going through emotional destruction and I wasn't hurting myself, but I'm just saying my mind was in a bad place. I was hurting and to have them come at me like that. I didn't want to give away my daughter, but I didn't want them to lead me to believe that everything was going to be okay, only to come up later and be like, oh, well, you know, we're going to take them for this reason. They had nothing. I have a full year of paperwork after that saying everything's good. We checked out the house. We checked out the kids. We checked out the daycare. And this went on several times a week. Children are with the mother. There is no risk at this time. Every single report says the same thing. It took six weeks to get toxicology back. Not only did they not find the morphine from the night before at the hospital, they found nothing else but potentially a half a beer from the day before she died. So they're saying she may have had a half a beer the day before she died. They're not sure. It didn't look like it was much if it was anything. Her kids really struggled. My mom adopted her kids and she had already been in the process of that just because with Jesse's seizures, it was very hard. She had many different types of seizures. She had absence seizures. So you would look at her and think, okay, she's she can hear me, she's standing, but her eyes would sort of glaze over. And then when she came to, her mind was in the place where it left off in the conversation. It was a hard time. It was a really hard time. Um, she didn't do anything wrong, but I do take solace knowing that the seizure that killed her, that ultimately killed her, because that was the final report from the autopsy that she died from a grand mal seizure. And I've had grand mal seizures and a couple of minutes before there are visible signs before other people see it. I'm fully checked out. I'm off in La La Land. I'm in a happy place. It's almost like a dream and you feel no pain. You feel no pain, you feel no suffering. So I take solace in that. Every grand mal seizure I've ever had has been like that. I mentally check out. Uh, apparently my, um, tone will change, my cadence will change. So the way I'm speaking will sort of tip off the people who know. And then when I go into the grand mall, they all have to sit and watch helplessly while my body does what it's gonna do. And sometimes it's medication related because we know I have issues with a lot of medications, but 
I know those final moments for her were peaceful and she was able to leave okay. She died beautiful. Laying on the bathroom floor, she was beautiful. You don't, you don't expect to see or hear that when you're talking about someone who has just died. She was gorgeous, porcelain skin, curly hair, just gorgeous. I looked like a wreck. Three young children, I looked like a disaster. But that is the story of my sister dying at the age of 29. She was actually the first survivor after my four older brothers all died shortly after birth. So my mother has lost five children and has three remaining. That's that's rough. It was all because they were just born a little, a little bit too early. Not even very early, just a little too early for the 70s. Anyway, I'm going to go over this video and make sure I got the details in, got the point across. But Jessie Atwood, she was a sweet girl. She was funny. Everybody was her friend. She was a friend to everyone. And I'm not saying that because she's dead, because I am a true believer that whether a person is living or dead, speak your truth. If she were a bad person, I'd say so. No. And a week before she died, we sat down in our living room floor and just talked. Just talked. And it was great. And I'm glad we did that. So, knowing about her life, watching her grow up, now watching her kids grow up, I feel the need to step in and tell them what I feel she would want them to know or want them to change. Because we talked about all those things. Right before she died, a week before she died, we talked about those things, what she wanted for her kids. How she wanted them to grow up. She had no idea. She had no idea. But I loved her. And she was my friend. So that's the story of that. Have a good one.